because we had a few minutes to, to chat before the, the panel started. And you've certainly worked on a wide array, array of different brands. And I, why do you feel it's so important today for brands to really take a stand on equality? I think more and more um, our, our consumers are expecting um, authenticity in brands. And, and the world is changing. And they want to see that reflected in, in the way that brands are communicating um, and, and in a very authentic manner. When, when I think about um, a business I spent a lot of time on is L'Oreal, which is the beauty category, which is kind of a traditionally female category. And I think historically, the largest brands have um, kind of created a dynamic or defined a, a specific kind of beauty, which is not reflective of what the world looks like today. And it's been a beauty that's been imposed. And more and more, we're seeing women, rightfully, and men who engage in the category reject that and want to see greater representation of who they are and what they look like and what their friends look like. And I think, particularly in the younger consumer, there is this expectation that, that we um, that we invite them in and we engage them in. And a lot of the brands that we're seeing that are winning are doing that because they're not imposing uh, a vision of beauty which is unidimensional. They're really um, inviting people in and celebrating them for, for whatever they look like and whatever they believe in and, and, and based on um, all kinds of different dimensions and not the singular focus on the color of your hair, the color of your skin, the color of your eyes. Great. I'm sure some others, uh, do you guys have other examples outside of the beauty category of just the, the power that brands can have and the impact on consumers in changing the cultural conversation? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I spent some time earlier this week reviewing a lot of the work here at Cannes, and, and one of the things that struck me was that I think and I'm inspired for our industry, I think in a lot of ways brands are picking up and filling a gap that you know, government and social organizations have let fall, and people, quite frankly, especially in America, people have just sort of ab abandoned. And, and what I see is brands coming in and filling that gap and saying the things out loud publicly to large audiences that need to be said. I think, um, you know, the, the work that you guys did, and I'm going to totally screw it up, but the little girl standing in, yeah, yeah, fearless girl, um, you know, there was a, a lot of work around um, uh, refugees and immigrants. There was a lot of work around homeless. And I think it, it makes me proud at, that it, at a time when other institutions aren't standing up um, to things that I was taught are just basic right things and wrong things. It makes me proud to see brands doing that. And, and I think, you know, we are, we are you know, similar. I, I think about it in the same way that, that newspapers were sort of talked about as being maybe irrelevant. And in, and in this world, they've become super relevant. I think brands have this opportunity to become super relevant because they're doing something that's necessarily and important in the world, especially at this moment. And I, and I love that. I love it for our industry, and I love it for our clients. So. Can I add to that? Yeah. Um, so one of the brands, if you think about um, what happened during um, the Super Bowl, um, so just after the election, if you remember, there were many brands out there that talked about diversity and inclusion. Um, and there were some for me that missed the mark because it wasn't inherently who they were. Um, the one that got it right for me, and I know they put this together really quickly, was Airbnb. Mm. Because you know that execution, it may not have been the best ad at the Super Bowl, but um, it was the one that was true to who they are. So the idea of belong anywhere is just inherently you know, part of, of their, their gestalt. And I think that's an important message for brands. It's not enough to put it in an ad once. You have to live it and be it. I think also it's, um, it's also important to think about brands and, and the companies they are and how important it is for them. Um, one of our clients is uh, Jaguar Land Rover and they are desperate to try and get more women in technology and in their design and, and mechanical parts of their business. Um, and it's really hard because getting young women through graduate programs in engineering and technology is difficult. So they're supporting the STEM program. But also what they did is they, um, they worked uh, with us to do something with Getty Images.
where actually if you look at Getty Images and you look at trying to get images of people working on a manufacturing line or working in technology, it's all men. And so we shot a whole range of images that had women doing that so that we could also play our part in making sure that when people were searching images, they had the, the range that they needed to select. So I think it's so important to go both ways as well and really think about companies and how it's going to help companies do that as well as the outside image that they're portraying to attract their consumers. I see you nodding. I would just add that beyond the right thing to do, right, if it makes sense for your business, it gives you that competitive advantage of building an emotional connection and loyalty with the brand. So, And, and I think we can all think of examples where it might have missed the mark. What can brands be doing and agencies be doing to make sure that they don't miss the mark? How, how do they, you know, what's the work they need to do up front? Yeah, can, I'd love to answer this. First thing, oh God, my hair is getting my mouth, sorry. <laughs> First thing I, I think we should do is get the women out of the kitchen. You know, um, we, we continually kind of do advertising that, that, um, that places the woman in the kitchen. I don't understand that. I've been doing this for 27 years and it, that, that hasn't really evolved much. Um, you know, I think it's really important that we kind of hold hands and say that we have to question, um, is this a, a, a fair representation of, of, of women or diversity? Um, one of the things that we're implementing at Hill Holiday is that we have in-house research, which is a really great thing because we can plant questions in, in our surveys that ask, uh, you know, in pre-testing, is this ad representing women fairly? Is it representing, you know, people of color fairly? Um, where do we miss the mark? How can we amend this? Um, I think it's all of our, you know, collective responsibility to do that as advertising agencies and brands. And when we get a brief from a client that says, you know, well, our testing says that it's much better if you show this individual in, in a, an environment like X. I think it's important that we, we challenge that, you know, and sometimes that's hard when you're against deadlines, but it's a critical thing for us to, to push against. Mm -hmm. And just building on that, I I think it's totally incumbent upon brands to make a stand on some of these issues, but I think there's a, I'm going to say, smaller first step to, to your point, which is just some sort of just and fair and accurate representation of women and minorities in advertising. And it's all of our responsibility because it's a joke and it's not good enough. And even just starting with that, with that first step would make, I think, a huge difference. I think, too, uh, one of the things we're doing at Carmichael Lynch is making sure that when we do have an idea that's taking a stand in one of these areas, that we are not only looking at research on inclusion, but also running it by people in that group and people that we may not think are in that group to get varying opinions of how we're portraying somebody and making sure that it's um, it's not to um, one down one path or another, right? And we're not pinpointing someone in a direction we shouldn't be. If I can add, I think an important component of it as well is helping our clients have the courage to do it. Because it's really hard to break kind of corporate cultures that have been successful and have portrayed people in certain ways and have seen their businesses grow. And at, at the top levels of these companies that have been inherently successful, they have a model in their head. And we're bringing them something different, and it's scary. And and part of it is, it is our responsibility, I think, in, in communication, not just to make sure that we're representing consumers in an appropriate way and getting and getting them their buy-in, but as an agency, helping our clients understand and have the courage to take those risks because there are risks. They're, you know, they're they're doing it in a different way, and it's hard. And they're they feel like their jobs are on the line. If we can't give them that courage, we will never get over that boundary. I think that's, that, I think that's so true. Yeah. I think you know. Um, company like Disney, um, who put Beauty and the Beast out recently um, and actually focused on potentially the first gay relationship in a Disney cartoon. Um, some of the countries banned it and Disney were like, great, fine, don't show it. Yeah, it starts the conversation. Exactly. And I think, you know, really helping our clients understand that they're going to be in that situation too and not everyone's going to like it because not everyone can like everything. Yeah. And really encouraging that bravery, I think, is so important. Absolutely, and I think that that's a really nice segue. Um, Naomi, I wanted to ask, you know, start with you on question number two. No, um, no, but just about all of you are, are female leaders, um, and how can you use some of your leadership qualities to really push the change and the disruption with your clients that you want to see? 
So I think there's a lot to be said for the power of intuition as a leadership quality, and that's a, a quality that I think is innately female. I think you can't really be taught it specifically or learn it. I think it's an innate trait, and through the power of my own intuition, I, I know that women are more intuitive than men, but I didn't want to sit on the panel and then make a complete tit of myself if someone asked the question of, is that actually true? So I did a quick little web search before I came here, and through the power of the interweb, there is a very robust body of evidence which categorically states that women are more intuitive than men. Surmise, surmising in the article in Psychology Today, Women's Intuition, Myth versus Reality, women are better able to read facial expressions so we can read the subtle emo emotional messages that people send, but non-verbal, which is, I mean, we're, I don't want to say we're clearly the better, but we are more intuitive. And I think, A, boom, that uh, my intuition was correct and that we are more intuitive. And also, I think when we're discussing sensitive issues like these and polarizing issues, having some sort of level of EQ, maybe a higher level of EQ, makes it um, we're better, better maybe able to navigate those conversations. I've been really focusing on three things in addition to that. Um, one is really around, if you make it to this level when you're a female, you know how to overcome odds. And resilience is a really, really big thing that we all, I think, share. And when you have that, and you can bring that to your client businesses as well, of overcoming odds of new competitive threats or whatever it might be, just that innate nature of overcoming odds is something that we can bring to the table for our clients and, and as leaders in the, in the organization. And the second one, is really around necessary efficiency. So when you are um, a mom or not a mom, or whatever you have on your plate as a woman, dogs, dogs could be <laughs> horses, whatever. Um, it's so important that you are able to do your job really, really well and really, really efficiently because you're trying to participate in school, you're trying to maybe coordinate a nanny, you may be involved in the community. And um, as it's been brought up before, again, not just me saying this, but statistically, 80% um, of women are still doing the majority of the housework at home, so necessary efficiency. Um, and the third one is really that emotional literacy that you were talking about um, and making sure that we are connecting the right people to get the job done. You know, we, <clears throat> at UN, we actually have a leadership team that's 50-50 uh, male-female, which wow. is unusual in the industry. And, and On purpose? <laughs> Sorry, can I ask a question? It was on purpose. Yeah. Um, it was something we have been working towards and, and we achieved. It is amazing how different the company is run because of that balance. Yeah. And, and the big thing that I find is that there is, we are, we've never been a command and control type of agency. Like it just, it's not culturally who we are. But, but I think one of the things that the female um, end of the spectrum is bringing to us is, is, is an ability to rethink things and not be so, we made a decision, so that's what it is. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we recently had this, this instance where we're planning um, a community day, which is really important, part of our values, part of, like, who we are, and a meeting got scheduled that conflicted with that, that was gonna take the whole leadership out. And it was all the women who raised their hands and said, wait, what are we doing? We are trying to build a culture, we believe in these values. Like, why would we do this? And I think A, the fact that we had a group of people who spoke up about it, but B, that then because we have this diversity on the team, we listened to each other and we actually changed it. And I think that that is one of the things that I love, and I think as we've been working, I think one of the ways it's playing out in our work is we don't, we don't get, like we love ideas and we get excited about ideas, but we don't get so held to every little piece of that idea that we can't evolve it, and I think part of getting really brave work and exciting work in market is getting it exactly right, and you don't always get it exactly right the first iteration. And sometimes you need 15 iterations for it to be exactly right. And I think one of the things I'm proud of is we are a group of people who really listen, we really try to listen to each other, take feedback, evolve, and, and think about things not in a something was my idea and I've got to defend it, 
but really in a, okay, somebody's giving me some feedback and how do I use that and what do I do with it? And I think that is a very female sort of dynamic that's been added to our business. Can, can I mention um, that earlier in my career, um, the boss that I had, he was a, I'm a planner, so he was the global head of planning. I, I wouldn't say who it was. But he said to myself and all the other, in a meeting, actually called a meeting, um, all the other global um, planning directors, right, you have to keep the emotion out of the room. <laughs> and I remember we all kind of looked at each other and said, okay, do we, and he was, he was a difficult person, so we didn't want to go there. So we just kind of bitched about it afterwards. <laughs> But I do want to say that um, I have caught myself saying that a couple of times to people in my department. And my department is predominantly women. Um, and then stop myself and say, just ignore what I said. That's just some weird ab reaction to something that happened to me early in my career. But um, speaking of emotion, I actually think it's quite the reverse. I think that with women, um, now nobody wants to hear you moan about your boyfriend all night long or all day long at work. That, not that kind of emotion. But we're very good at tapping into the kind of, um, you know, the, the feelings, the F word, you know, the feelings of our consumers and stuff that's important to them and going there, going to places that are difficult. Uh, we just completed a campaign that um, one of my colleagues is sitting here, namesake Leslie, where I watched you and the two of us were in tears watching it. It was for RIBO, which is a Novartis drug for women with stage four breast cancer. You'll see it soon and it's women talking about what's happening to them and I've never seen braver women in my entire life. But we went there, you know, and, and I think that that's the beauty of, of being a woman in this industry is touch into what makes you female. You know, hold on to that and corral that and use that energy to, to make advertising and communications that matter, you know? Otherwise, what's the point? Because this is supposed to make people feel something, right, what we do, so, yeah. <laughs> and, and so what are some of the, 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 the ways within your organizations that you can, um, you know, I think obviously there's a lot of buy-in, but I'm sure there are challenges in getting um, some of your colleagues comfortable with that. So can, can you talk to us a little bit about some of the things you're doing within your organization that inevitably impact the outward facing messaging which hits consumers? One of the things that we're doing is um, when we have talented women, putting them on uh, kind of traditionally male businesses. Um, Microsoft, we have a fantastic team, a creative team of women who've come up with some remarkable, insightful work that happens to be about one of the, one of the things we were just talking about, which is um, getting girls through STEM and encouraging them to stay in there. Because you know what, the world needs diversity of thinking. Because women do think differently and they do have um, different values in some cases. And being able to encourage young girls to kind of go through those programs and, and bring that to the world and, and, and have them invent and innovate and um, so that we can all benefit. So I think that is one of the things that we're kind of endeavoring to do is making sure that we're breaking down those barriers by, um, by putting women in these kind of traditionally male businesses um, because, because what we create needs to go out there and, and encourage, encourage women. And, and the other thing that I would add is I think there has to be a system, um, and I believe me, I fully embrace intuition, passion, emotion, all of that. But I do think that there has to be a system where at the top of the company, we look at a structure of KPIs that expand beyond the kind of very traditional um, uh, ways of evaluating people, where it was all about being aggressive. It's all about um, making sure that uh, we trample the competition. and. We balance that with some of these other things that we've been talking about because I think it's the only way that we're going to be able to expand um, and get and surround ourselves by by people with different perspectives, with different experiences, with different cultures, um, to be able to have a positive impact on our business. You, you know, it's funny. That is the other thing that has been a big shift. Is I think when when we were more male oriented, <clears throat> we would do this thing where we like develop KPIs and then everybody below you would get them and like sort of weirdly water them down and make them relevant. <laughs> um, and, and, and the conversations we have now are much more about what is that specific person good at and what's the place we need the, that capability the most. And it completely, it has completely changed how we think about staffing, how we think about performance, how we think about what people are doing and not doing. And I think it, and, and we still have to catch ourselves. Like I, I 
somebody gave me feedback recently that I had I had been too angry. And I and I actually said I'm not taking that feedback, thank you, because if I was a man you wouldn't have given yeah. it to me. And he and he agreed. So we still I mean, even though we're in a in a good dynamic, you still have to catch ourselves. But I think it, it when you have diversity of people in an organization, and believe me, we need way more diversity in terms of color and, and, and ethnicity, but you get out of that, everybody has to look like the person at the top and, and mimic that person, and, and you get much more into, what am I specifically good at? What do I love doing? What am I gonna be passionate about? Which I think is the place where people perform best anyway, so it's, it, it makes everybody more effective, in my opinion. Totally agree. I think the art of management is putting people in the job where they can excel. You, you yes. don't, you know, you don't, you don't put somebody that's bad in math in accounting. <laughs> so like, and everybody has strengths and weaknesses, and, and part of it is finding that role where they can excel and they can add value to the community. We actually went the other way um, because obviously we started our agency and there were just four of us, and um, was, so, well, there was uh, myself and George. Um, and uh, uh, Robin, uh, our finance guy, and Gemma, who just did everything and made the agency <laughs> what it was. Um, but 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 we were really looking for people who came with a superpower, but were looking to grow and expand their knowledge and collaborate with other creative collaborators. So we kind of hired a, a, an agency of mainly women, um, for which I shall always be grateful to my wonderful work husband, George. Um, so we actually had to sit down and have a conversation about about bringing more men in, in, into the company. Um, and now, you know, we're, we're, we're much more balanced, but I think one of the things that we do, and it's absolutely to your point, we, we try not to pigeonhole people, we try and not have hierarchies, we try and, and enable people to move around as much as they want to. And I think one of the things that I've really learned about myself um, starting up our business and also working with the wonderful women that I do in, in our company is, it's really breeding the confidence to enable women to stand up and say, yes, I want to do this. And actually talking to, to, to our women and saying, nobody's going to look after your career apart from you. And if you have the confidence to stand up and say, look, I've been here and I want to be here, do it. We'll embrace it. We'll do absolutely everything we can to move you around. And I think that's so, so important for all of us as female leaders to really inspire the women in, in our organizations to have the confidence to say, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to create my own career. And for each stage of their life, too. Um, one story I have from the last year or so is I had a woman who's a very high performer, really great um, relationship with a big client come to me and say, almost in tears say, I don't think I can do this anymore. My husband's traveling all the time. I'm traveling. We now have a child. Um, I just don't think but the clients need this, and I just don't think I'm doing my best because of all these things that are happening at this time in my life. And I looked at her, and I said, I heard you say that your husband said that it's hard for you to do this, and I want to know how you feel and how you want to be able to continue your career on this leadership path. And she said, well, I think I can do it. And I said, all right, well, let's talk about the barriers to doing it, and let's figure out a way that we can set up something to your unique strength yeah. at yeah, this time in your life to stay here. And so I said, give me a night and come back in the morning. And we came up with a plan to do, um, we moved her to a local client where she wasn't traveling all the time and, and a few other things. And um, she is, is one of the most loyal, high-performing em employees now. And I think it's so important for us as female leaders to champion keeping people in the business at different stages in their life, especially when they are high performers. But also, not just for her, presumably the rest of the organization will see the effort that you put in with that Absolutely. female. And I could count on you. Like That make, you know, must be very empowering for all the women. One of the big challenges that we have in, in I think our collective industries is hiring female creatives. Um, you know, especially senior creatives, because what happens is they tend to get to, to your point, they get to a point where they have children then with production and everything. It's just unsustainable, and so they leave. And so we've made a concerted effort over the last two years in particular. Um, our creative department now consists of 44% of female, which is the highest it's ever been in my career. So I think, you know, dedicating ourselves to, to making sure that we continue to fill that pipeline um, is critical. And how have you done that? Because it's so hard. Yeah, it is so hard. So we, I was listening to a panel yesterday, and they talked about how this isn't just the remit of HR. I think that's a common mistake in agencies, right. so telling HR, get find us some great female creative. Well, they don't know where they are. So it's literally, and by the way, we have the same uh, program in place with diversity. 
um, of finding people, especially senior people, that we all admire in events like this, actually. Um, and then ha starting a conversation with them early. And it's the, the responsibility of every single person at the agency, and they know that. Um, so when you find somebody, you know, you recommend them, we bring them in, we interview them, we start a relationship, and we keep on them until ultimately they either say yes or no. Yeah. Those examples were amazing. And I, uh, before we turn it over for questions, because I know that you guys are going to have some, clearly just from listening to you all and, and looking at your resumes, we know you're amazing leaders. If you had to sum up your leadership style or how you would want people to refer to you, as a leader, can you think of one or two words, um, especially that ties in your, your feminine leadership style? Um, I've been thinking about the word empathetic a lot recently, and I think it's a, it is a word that went out of style, but I want to bring it back. And I think so, so much of communication is less about talking and more about understanding. And, um, and so that's what I'm working on this year, is how do I be an empathetic person, and how do I build empathy into the organization, and how do we become an organization that is an empathetic organization? So such a good one, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. so <laughs> Stop yelling. Uh, so just go right down the line. I don't know, this morning I took a test and I was actually, the output was connector. So mm. <laughs> we'll see, we'll, uh, we'll see, but right, <laughs> right, yep, you know exactly where I was. Yeah. Um, but I've always said it's all about um, authentic leadership and empowerment of the right people at the right time. So I, I sometimes struggle with that question, not in terms of why, why I'm great, because it's just brilliant and inspiring. Into but we yeah. know. <laughs> Duh. Um, no. Duh. <laughs> Why, um, like, sort of, what female qualities I would also bring to that? Or because any qualities, I know, but I sort of struggle leader. with the phrasing of the question almost because oh. it upsets me in my tummy because right. I want to be thought of as a good leader on a my good own. Leader. Yeah. Absolutely. But I know that we're here talking about. No, uh, so I no, sort of have an want, internal struggle think, with that sometimes. I think it's just about how leadership styles are changing yeah. Yeah. to meet current culture. And yeah. I do think that we're looking to new qualities. As certainly yeah, as we, we look, have as a group, yeah. as we have as a group, yeah. um, and those leaders driving change are different different leaders than we've yeah. traditionally known. That's why I thought it was interesting when you said that about the chap saying that you were angry and you stood up for <laughs> yourself. Because I was talking about this panel with someone, and I was you know saying some point of view, and he was like, "Oh, you're being very strident." And I was like. What? No, I've got a point of view. And, that, ah, and it's the same. We get tarred with, uh, it's not fair. Anyway, my personal motto is work hard and be nice to people. I think that's, do that. I think for, for me, it's uh, together we can make this happen. Um, and I think that, you know, that's something we've always had right at the heart of, of the Brooklyn Brothers. Um, and it's kind of the leadership style that I hope George and, and myself share because, you know, we, we had a vision but that vision we had eight years ago is is not what the agency is now, and it's been the whole agency that's done that. And I really hope that you know anyone that comes and works with them, male, female, bi, straight, gay, feels that they have got a home at Brooklyn Brothers and a voice, and together we can make it happen. Uh, two words, probably um, assertive and kind, maybe. Aww. You know, I think those two things can can live together. And traditionally, you know, um, they they didn't in the, in the past in agencies. Um, but also, we have at our place, we have a, a credo. Um, we have three words that everybody knows, which is hungry, humble, human. Yeah? And, you know, I think that's how I would describe myself as well. Pretty much everyone at Hill, actually. Yeah. I find it very difficult to go last. <laughs> and All the good add, words are and, and add, yes. <laughs> So I would say being humble enough to say, I don't know. <laughs> or I would also well, say that we, we do have a phrase similar to what Naomi was saying at, 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 at our place, which I really subscribe to, which is be hard on the work and, and good to the people. Um, yeah, so I, I think. Yeah. Um, and I think what's interesting is all of your answers, I think, are what consumers want from brands. So it's so important that that's coming from the leaders and the ones driving brand messaging. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to the audience for any questions that you might have on any of the things from any of these amazing women. Ladies, thank you so much. Um, so as leaders who have men and women reporting to you, do you find that 
you behave differently as a boss towards your male subordinates versus towards your female subordinates because I run a company and I find that I do that. Um, I find that when I give feedback to the guys on the team, I generally have to, like if they've done something wrong, I generally have to be much more gentle and I have to be, I have to, <laughs> I, I can't kind of just say like, well, this was shit, how did we do that? <laughs> so, but I don't, I don't know if this is a sort of universal thing or is it just me? You know, I, I, go, go ahead. I'm very much a mom. I have two little boys who are completely different human beings. And I feel like the agency has just been a continuation of that job as mom. And so I don't think of it so much as I treat men one way and women the other way. But I, I think I, I try very hard to treat everybody sort of individually. And there are people that I can sit down with and be super blunt and you know super straightforward and they'll pick themselves up and move right along and then there are other people that I have to be a little more gentle with there are people who I will give them feedback five times and they won't hear it until I really give them feedback and there are people who I nudge a little tiny bit and they go. so my my approach is less is it a male or a female and more you know, what does that individual person need and how do they respond and what's our relationship and, you know, a whole host of things go into that. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that and I would take it even one more step and say, I think all humans are vulnerable and all humans have insecurities and some people take direction better and some people take criticism better, but I feel like um, men, women, all need to be able to be served up information in a way that allows them to integrate it and change for the better. Um, so I, I, I like Kasha. I think it's, it's, it's more about. I try and get the message across in a way for male, for men and women in a way that is palatable, where they can digest it, and there's probably less difference. Do you know what? I'll confess. Um, I have to watch myself. <laughs> I have to watch myself because uh, there is a little bit of unconscious bias in me. I have two sons, a daughter and two stepdaughters. And so with, like you with the boys and they're all teenagers and older. With the boys, you know, I have to kind of drive things home to them in a really assertive, sometimes aggressive way. So I've got to watch myself, you know, honestly, that I don't kind of trip over that kind of, that, trip into that, that pitfall. Um, and I think it's important to treat everybody equally, but I completely agree with what you guys are saying. It's like each individual you treat separately. We're all very different. Yeah. I think, I think for me, um, one of the things I've learned giving feedback to, to, to men or, or women is um, talk less and ask more questions. And, and that's certainly something that's kind of stood me in good stead as I've learned that more. Um, because so often you're thinking about the point of view that you're trying to get across, whereas actually really trying to understand where that person is and then see if that point of view even matches is, is so important. So it's certainly something I learned and got so badly wrong when I, I kind of first started out. I, me, this, and I. <laughs> oh, you. Me. <laughs> no. So yeah, definitely, I think asking more questions, and I, w I would totally echo what, what, what my colleagues have said here, which is it's, it's, it's more about the person than, than the gender I've found. You know, I've, I've worked with really sensitive and, and, and um, emotionally vulnerable men um, and very strident and incredibly strong women um, and it, it's really about trying to find out the person certainly I found I think the question strategy helps people also come to the conclusion themselves and be more self-aware and that's strategy has worked well for me too first of all thank you so much and I think you know this is our last panel for can and I'm quite sad I mean I'm quite exhausted but I'm really exhilarated and you know one of the powers of the girls lounge is working together and we are a family and, you know, I always say a woman alone has power. Collectively, we have impact. We help each other. When you help a woman rise, we all shine. And Liz, I just have to say thank you to you. I really, I've been in the outdoors all day for four days, and I was just exhausted, truthfully. And I said, Liz, can you just get the mic and, and you know, host this conversation? And With these women, it was an easy, yeah, easy and, to... 
But I threw her in the fire, and it, it was just yes, and, you know, and then what do you need me to do? And I just really appreciate that. And I think that's what this, this is really all about. We've now connected 17,000 corporate women to one another through the Girls' Lounge. It is my greatest, greatest joy. And I'm going to cry when I say this, when I see all of you women walking on the quasette, high-fiving each other. And I'd say five years ago, I didn't know any of you. And I have 17,000 new girlfriends. And, and I, I want you to understand what that means. I came to Cannes six years ago knowing no one as a researcher. And I wasn't welcomed in any group because no one knew me, you know? And I wanted to really understand the media world. And I went to the opening party and the closing party because I was the loser. I didn't know, no one invited me to anything. And I remember walking back on the quasette feeling so sad, like I'm going to my room and then what? And now when we have this girls' lounge, it is the home for women. All you women know you are welcome here. And you few good men, the girls' lounge, sorry, not sorry, is a space for women to spend time together to get to know one another, to support one another, competitor, whatever you are, it doesn't matter. We're all women that can use that amplified voice. We can use, you know, sharing similar challenges, getting advice, you know, from real women that have experienced it. That's what this is really all about. And I just, you know, I couldn't be more proud knowing that each and every one of you, A, contribute. You know, this is not my lounge, it's not yours, it's our lounge. And it gets bigger, it gets better. You know, we had 600 women for dinner on Monday night. This place holds 150. And, you know, even the hotels, this is our fifth year here, they said we're their favorite event of the year, uh, of the whole year, including the film festivals and all the Hollywood stars, because it's meaningful and it matters. And they've been watching the evolution and the change. So I said for every four women counted as one. And that's how we got it in. And it really, you know, there's always a solution. But most importantly, understand what the magic is. The magic is us working together, learning together, breaking the rules together, because they need to be broken. Catherine Hepburn says, if you obey all the rules, you don't have any fun. We've had so much fun up here this week. This really, the buzz was crazy. The level of conversation went through the roof. But we don't just talk about the problems. What happens here is we activate solutions for change, and we hold ourselves accountable, and we hold people in our leadership teams accountable as well. We come back with confidence. And one of the things we're doing for men, just for the record, is you know, gender equality is not a female issue. It is a social and economic issue. We are 50% of the population. We have to include men. So under the female quotient, we have a pillar called culture, where we work with leadership, men and women, in Davos at the World Economic Forum. It's not a girls' lounge. It's an equality lounge, talking about solutions for change. And we do coaching inside of companies, men and women, so that everyone is involved and we can really you know, activate change. But I want to thank each and every one of you. You make us better every single day. And we could not do it without you. Here's to you. Thank you.